there's been a down payment made, is what that means. That's the actual wordage there. There's been a down payment made. God's made a down payment into us for a reason, so that we never settle for anything less. Here we have Ezekiel, which was written centuries, centuries before Jesus' life. And in that writing, Ezekiel says, you see the very bottom there where it's bold? The goal, the goal of all this washing and scrubbing and putting in new heart, the goal of all of that, you will be my people and I will be your God. Then you look down at Revelation. That's the end of the book, right? We all agree on that. That's where God sums everything up. And look what he says. Look what's in bold. They will be my, you will be my people, and I will be your God. Again, you see that? I want you to hold on to those thoughts, because you are going to leave today crystal clear understanding the new covenant. The, yeah, yeah, that's a little distracting there. That little, it's okay. She is listening. So we all on the same page there? Today we end up our seminar on the covenants. I struggled with this message today mightily. Ask Teresa, ask Carolyn, ask my secretary Judy, who's always the recipient of my sermons. I changed it how many times? Fred says three. Yeah, three times, Teresa, you saw the drafts falling on the floor. I never do that. I, I usually just... Boom, it's done, it's done. I struggled mightily with this, and I'll tell you why. I think that the trick for us as God's people is to take our faith and what we say we believe and to put it into simple terminology. Can you do that? Try that on sometime. We're going to do that today, and it's hard. Because what we're going to leave behind is all the Bibleese, all the evangelical sound bites, and all the cliches that we say about our faith that we don't understand, but they sound good. So we're going to articulate the covenants today in down-to-earth language. And let me ask you a question before we start. Is competent, what, what is competency, to be competent at something? My, my theory is this. Competent, because you're competent, does not mean you're useful. Would you agree with that? Can you be competent at something and not be useful? Well, I can tell you that that's true. You, you, I graduated with guys f from a professional school in Chicago. They, they, were, they were good students. They did well in their clinical trials. They were competent. They never practiced one day. All of that competency wasted, gone. You know, we, 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 we say that about people. Oh, they had, we, we say, oh, they had such potential. What a shame. They had such potential and they just, they wasted it. They never used it. Competency is not useful unless it's demonstrated. Tad is a teacher. He's, he's a competent teacher, but he's not useful unless he is able to get into the classroom and do it. Right? What good is it if you're competent about something and you don't never practice it? You're, you're of no good to anybody. You're not useful. How do I know that? And I'm going to invite you to, for the next 30 minutes, re really laser beam in on this message because it's vital and important. And is it salvific? Is my message today salvific? Meaning, does this determine whether you're saved or not, what I'm going to talk about today? Well, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I think that it is salvific. I, I believe that it is determinative on, on whether you are saved, which I don't like that term. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I don't think it is salvific. So this is Sunday. I could go either way. 
But, but I think, I, I know this. Today's message, I know the enemy did not want you to hear this today. I, I really did a, 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 a lot of praying this week over each one of you. And again, thank you for sitting in the same pews every Sunday. It makes it so easy for me to pray. See, if you miss, and I forget where you sit, then I, I prayed that, that the enemy would not prevent you from coming, first of all, and he does want to do that, you know. That's, if he can keep you from coming, that's, that's number one, he wins. Number two, that when you do come, that, that distractions leave and that you're able to, to, to listen with the, with the ears. Like Jesus said, if you have, if you have ears, you better listen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend that today. You know what I can't get out of my head, and we talked about it some time ago, is the parable of the talents. From the word, from the lips of our Lord and Master, as recorded by Matthew, the parable of the talents keeps bouncing around in my head, and, and I, it won't go away. So I know when that happens that the Holy Spirit's got something here, right? He wants, he wants us to learn something from that parable. Yes, Sarah's leaving with Claire. Okay, let's all notice that. Okay, now we're done. Okay. The parable of the talents won't leave, the Spirit wants to teach us something. Now, why do I know that being competent is not synonymous with being useful? Parable of the talents. Here we have a master going away in that parable. He calls his own slaves. You here are slaves of our Lord and Master. The master recognizes that they're his slaves. He recognizes that you are his slaves. And he calls the three of them, and he knows that all three of those slaves are competent. Why? How do I know that from that parable? Well, what would you do? If you're going away and you want to turn your possessions over to somebody, this is what happens in this parable, he leaves and he turns all of his possessions over to these three slaves. I'm darn sure I'm not going to turn over my possessions to somebody who I know to be incompetent. Neither would you. Would you? He turns it over to each three of these slaves, so that means, says to me, he knows that they're competent. Each of their comp and here, here we got to get a hold of this. Each of their competency is at a different level. The parable says, according to their own ability. Now you all have competency at a different level. My competency is not yours. Yours is not mine. It doesn't work that way. It's not like a a, a meter that that. Because someone's competency is higher, that they get better rewards from our Lord and Master. That's not the case here. You can't get out of it that way. You have been given an ability, each of you. You're competent at something. God has gifted you that way. But are you useful? So he goes away. He gives each slave something. What does he give him? His own things. God has given you, this is, a, this is a, a, a sobering thought, he's given you, each of you, something of his that only you are competent to invest. He's given Fred something that only Fred is competent at investing. According to Fred's competency, uh, boy, that competency level, And the same with each of you. I cannot invest what he's given you. You cannot invest what he's given me. But if you don't do the investing, if you don't show yourself to be useful, that which he's given you, what happens? Is this salvific? I keep coming back to the parable of the talents. We better listen to this. Like like Jesus said, the road is narrow, and there are very few who find it. So he comes back. He says to the first slave, you did well. You invested my possessions well. Now, go into this consummated kingdom and keep doing it. Second slave did the same thing. 
I gave you a gift. I gave you part of myself. You invested it well because I knew you were competent. I knew you could handle it. What I gave you, I knew you could handle. He did it well. Third slave. You know what strikes me about that third slave? And here's where if you come to Newville, you can't claim ignorance. And this third slave doesn't even claim ignorance. He says to the master, he says, yeah, I know that was your plan. He says, I know you. I know you wanted me to do this. I know you gave me your possessions. And I also know I was competent to do it. But I just didn't. Didn't, wouldn't, couldn't. I didn't do it. Is this salvific? Jesus says to that slave, the master, Jesus is the master in this parable. He says to that slave, you're evil and you're lazy. We have some lazy Christians. What do you think? Are you useful? Am I useful? I'm going to turn this on me. I turned it on myself all week. You don't need to worry about that. And is our salvation connected to this? And then you're going to say to me, well, we're not saved by works, Tim. And I'm going to say back to you, you profoundly misunderstand that, that passage in, that Paul's writing about. Profoundly. Paul's talking about works of the law. The Jewish Orthodox works is what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about good works, doing good things. So the third slave who was competent, and you're competent, the third slave who had an ability, you have an ability to do something. Maybe it is going out here on the bank and planting bulbs. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful gift and talent. And exercising that competency makes you useful. Maybe it's being an usher. Maybe it's being a greeter. Maybe it's being kitchen duty. Maybe it's cleaning. Maybe it's getting out your checkbook and writing a check. Maybe, maybe God has gifted you that way. There's your competency. There's your ability. But something has been given to you. You evil, lazy slave, you're done. I gave you an opportunity. You didn't invest what I gave you, even though you were competent to do it. Therefore, I have zero confidence that when we go into my consummated kingdom and my plan takes off, why would I ever think you're going to change? We were made to be useful to God. Remember ever and always refer back to that. Now, the covenant, we're talking about the covenants. We did a good covenantal study in our Bible study today. You, you, you people in that Bible study, when we go through Romans, you're going you're gonna to have it. You're going to get it when we're done. The covenant has made each of you competent. Liz, you're competent. Rocky, competent. The covenant assur- ensures us of that. But are you useful? Oh, ah. There's the rub. Competency is guaranteed and given to you by the covenant. Whether you're useful or not is where you have to cooperate. We do not have a passive faith. We are not spectators. So whether you're useful or not, demands your cooperation. I invite you to listen today. It's been heavy on my heart. This, this, is, this is my ministry here. This is, the, this is what I've been entrusted to do. God said to me years ago, get a hold of God's people, grab them by the shoulders, and shake them. He shook me first. So I'm going to simplify the covenant for you today. And here's, we're going to put it, here's the different language. What is the covenant? We're going to simplify it. First of all, what's this? See this? This is a memo from God to humanity. Let's think of it that way. A memo from God to humanity. And here's what the memo says. I have a plan. 
And I would like you to join. I would like you to experience genuine humanity. That's what this book says. Here's the memo. You are experiencing a parody of humanity. You're, you're experiencing something that the world has foisted on you as being genuinely human. You've bought into the values, goals, and commitments that the world says is what humanity should chase after. And the memo says, no, I want you to join because if you join me, you will experience for the first time what it means to be genuinely human. Now, what do I want you to join, God? God says, here's the plan. Here's what I have planned for you. This, this really helped me to put it in these words. God says to us in the memo, my plan is to create a worldwide family in whom I rule. And therefore, after that's accomplished, through whom I will rule my entire creation. Did you get, I want you to get that. that that's the Bible, what I just said. That's the Bible. That's the memo. Did you get the memo? To create a worldwide family in whom he rules. Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. Because if he rules in you, you've invested his possessions according to your ability. He will then say, like he said to those slaves, share your master's joy now I can trust you. I can run my entire created order through you because I know I rule in you. Got it? That's the plan that he's invited each of us to join. Now, what about the covenant? Well, do you think that, that would, that's, a, that's a task, isn't it? That's a thing. That, that's a big plan. How are we going to achieve it? God says, Here, here's how we're going to achieve it. I've written a contract so that I can achieve this plan. When they decided to do the road out here, someone came up with the plan. The Richland County engineer, I assume. And to make this plan come to fruition and to pull this plan into reality, in other words, he had to, the engineer, he gave a contract to somebody, didn't he? The, the excavators. And in the contract that, he, that the Richland County engineer gave the excavators so that his plan would come into reality, I'm sure that he listed the responsibilities. Here's, God says in the contract, here's my responsibilities, here are your responsibilities in order for my plan to come into reality. Right? Have you read the contract that you've signed? Would you ever do that? Would you ever? Here's what's happened to, to the Christian faith. Someone has told you what the contract is, right? You never really read it, did you? Maybe, maybe you have, but have you? I'll tell you, for years, I never read the contract. I just, I just, someone told me what the contract was. So here you are in a legal situation, and someone says, I want you to base your entire life on this contract. Okay, uh, don't worry about reading it. This is what it says. Okay, what do I do? Well, you sign right here. Why do I know this is true? I guarantee you this is true. I, I talked to someone in my own family, it, steeped in the church, steep, steeped in, in uh, even theological education. And I asked him about the, the covenant. I said, where's the covenant? You know, where the, you, know, you know where the covenant is, right? You all know where the covenant is, right? Jeremiah 31, 31, easy to remember, 31, 31. 
Didn't have any idea. And that said, put a light bulb on in my head, I'll bet you God's people have never read the contract. Yet, you've all been asked to sign it, and you're signing it based on what someone has told you. This is what it means to be a Christian, in other words. Now, I am going to invite you to do that with me. Proof text me. Don't just listen to what I'm saying. I invite you to read the contract and see if what I'm telling you is true. Because the contract that you've been asked to sign, and by the way, you've signed it, the slave signed it. You're going to be held accountable. When the road was done here, and the Ritson County engineer comes around, and he inspects it, and he says, wow, this is nothing that was in the contract. You just went off and did your own thing. Well, the, the, the excavator would say, well, the guy, the guy down the road said that this is the way it should be. And the engineer would say, did you read the contract? Because you signed it. And the excavator would say, well, no, I just heard that this is how it was going to be. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this stuff? And Jesus says back to them, you never read the contract. You signed it. You never read it. You're still held to the standards of that contract, whether you read it or not. God's people, listen, you're going to be held to this contract, whether you read it or not. And in the contract, his responsibilities and your responsibilities are listed. What is it? Ezekiel says it. What's his responsibilities? He says, I will demonstrate my holiness, his responsibility. What's your responsibility in that contract? Through you. Through you. You see, we have this divine dance that we have to do between the Holy Spirit's enablement and our free will. The Holy Spirit does not override or cancel our free will. The Holy Spirit has never picked me up out of my recliner and taken me into my study to practice solitude, silence, and study and prayer. Never. Wish you would. The Holy Spirit has never brought the checkbook to me and opened it up and given me a pen and said, contribute to these needy causes. The Holy Spirit doesn't get me up and bring me to this building. You have a responsibility. To be useful, it requires your cooperation. You evil, lazy slave. You were competent, but you were not useful. Paul says, those in the flesh are unable to please God. Why, Paul? Because they don't submit to his law. They're unable to. You, however, are not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. Therefore, you have been enabled. You are competent. Got the contract? Everybody understands the contract. Okay. The covenant that you've signed is the contract. We don't use the word covenant anymore, and I think that throws people off because we don't say covenant, we say contract. The covenant that we're talking about is the contract. And it has three clauses. This is simple, isn't it? Every contract has clauses. Here's the three clauses of the co a contract that you have signed. Darn well better read it. Number one, there's the redeem clause. Ezekiel, I'll wash you from your impurities. I'll sprinkle you with clean water. I will redeem you, clause one. We've got that down, don't we? I think we have the forgiveness and the redemption down. And that's where most people, I think, I'm afraid, have stopped reading the contract. We read the first clause, we're forgiven, we're redeemed, full stop. No need to read the rest. <coughs> clause two, you've been given something. Because you've been redeemed, you now are capable to be given something. I will put my spirit within you. I will give you a new heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. You've been given something. Second clause, clause three, 
the use clause, I now. The whole point of the redeeming, you could say, the whole point of the redemption clause, the whole part of the giving clause, the whole point was clause number three, use. Now I want to use you. When I demonstrate my holiness through you, I'm going to use you. Well, you see, we're going to 2 Corinthians 3, 6. You've signed this contract. I'm doing you a good service today through the Holy Spirit, I think. What does 2 Corinthians 3, 6 say? It says this. I will make you competent to administer that plan by giving you a gift from my future. I will make you competent, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, read Tim's paraphrase, I will make you competent to administer my plan by giving you a gift from my future. Well, what is the gift from God's future? Those are three questions. What's the gift? How does that make us competent? And then what do we do to actually demonstrate? How do we show our usefulness? How do we administer this plan? You know, remember the plan? To create a worldwide family in whom I rule and therefore through whom I will rule. Does he rule in you? I'm not talking about redeemed and forgiven. That removes the barrier so that he can rule in you. The question you need to ask yourself and I need to ask myself, does he rule in you? Because if he doesn't, how can he possibly rule through you? You're going to, be, you're going to go rogue on him. You're a loose cannon. You're the evil, lazy slave. He cannot trust you but he knows you're competent. What's the gift from God's future? A relationship. Now watch this, watch this. We saw in Ezekiel that God promised, I will be your God and you will be my people. We see in Revelation, the end of the book, I will be your God, you will be my people. The gift that God gives us that makes us competent from his future is the relationship with him that is intimate, immediate, and direct. Why? Because the barrier has been removed. We call it the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, and Jeremiah says, his job is to write the law in our heart And the upshot of that, Jeremiah says, when the law is written on your heart by that gift from God's future, the next thing that will happen to you is that I will be your God and you will be my people. Now here's how you're going to understand this. Remember the movie Back to the Future? Because today's title is Back to the Future Through the New Covenant. Remember Back to the Future? What was the professor's name, Barry? Yeah, yeah. Brown and then Marty uh, McFly. And Marty McFly, in one of those, there's three of them, one of those, he goes into the future. No, no, he goes from the future to the, to the past. Yeah. And, and the professor says to him, now listen, Marty, it's so important that you not divulge anything about the future. You can't have any newspaper clippings. You can't have anything that would tell these people in the past what is going to happen in the future because the minute you do that, you impact the future. You see, you change history. Right? You on board here? So Marty had to be so careful not to let anything out about the future because it would change You see, those movies, uh, there's so many. He couldn't let anything out about the future because it would change the future. Star Trek does this all the time. When Star Trek, would they go into a, a, a planet that is uh, not as advanced as they are, 
the prime directive, don't tell them anything about the future because it will change their evolution. It will change their future. You can't do that. We watched a movie last night. In fact, it was exquisitely appropriate. Uh, source code, science fiction movie. It was about that kind of thing. It was about, it was about someone who went into the past and to thwart a terrorist attack because he had knowledge gained from the future kind of thing. So here we have a gift from God's future. And the gift is a relationship that is supposed to be reserved for the end of the book. You see that in Revelation? That's the end of the book. Jesus walks among us, gifted with a relationship with his father. And from this relationship, he knew the way things were supposed to be. You see, when we have this relationship from God's future, doesn't, you know how things are supposed to be. And you know what God wants us to do with that? Not like Back to the Future movie. He wants us to divulge that. He wants us to let that out. He wants the future relationship reserved for the end of the book to be a reality now. And he wants us as God's people, gifted with that gift from the future, to demonstrate it. Let me put it another way. I had four sons. And... The relation, when my sons were born, there was a relationship. We have a relationship with God from his future. No one needed to tell me when I had those four little boys at home how to be a dad. No one needed to tell me to spend time with my sons. No one needed to tell me to read to my sons every day. No one needed to tell me that these minutes are passing by and you've got to grab every single one of them. Make it count. The relationship drew that out of me. Do you see that? How does God get us to be competent? Here and now by this gift from his future. You see, it's the relationship with him that is immediate, intimate, and direct that draws competency out of us. Don't, do you see that? My sons tell me and my wife tells me, you were a good dad. But it was... It was the relationship with those four precious boys that drew that from me. Do you see this? I didn't read a list or a book about how to be a father, how to be a dad, and then try to apply that. It sprung from me. I became competent based on the relationship. God has made you competent. To bring his future to bear now that should spring from an immediate, intimate, and direct relationship with him. That's the new covenant. I'm going to give you a gift for my future. Because we read that this, this relationship that is a sign that God's future world has arrived... That's what the Revelation verse says. Here's how we know God's future world has arrived. He will be your God and you will be his people. And from that relationship, he is going to do all kinds of exciting things with you. That relationship that is the sign of God's new world arriving has rushed forward to meet us in the present. Do you see? Back to the future. And what do we do? With that relationship, here's the hunger and thirst that God has put into our hearts. Here's, here's why the new covenant is such tremendously hopeful, encouraging news for God's people. Because we have a hunger and thirst to get 
back to the future. The fourth beatitude. We're hungering and thirsting for God's rightness to come into the world now because we've experienced it. You see, we have a taste of that in that relationship that the Holy Spirit gives us when he writes the law on our hearts and he becomes our God and we become his people and springing from that relationship, we get a glimpse of God's future and we say, I want that future to come to bear now and I will bring that to bear now in a thousand different ways. I will be useful to God for the very reason that I want others to experience this. God wants us to let the future out of the bag, so to speak. What what a brilliant plan for God to accomplish his purposes in us. You see, the old covenant was this. If you do thus and so, we'll have a relationship. The new covenant is this. The relationship proceeds the requirement. And from the relationship that you have with God, which is immediate, intimate, and direct, the requirements will spring. The relationship that I have with my sons, immediate, intimate, and direct, the requirements of being a good dad, daddy, father, sprung from that. Do you see this? That's the new covenant. That's 2 Corinthians 5.5. That's the quote. God has put a little bit of heaven in our hearts. His future, his new world, the relationship, he's put that into our hearts do you, do you look at not serving him as settling for less? You see, if with my sons, back to that. No one need tell me. I, I didn't go play golf. I didn't go off on and do other things. I didn't. I didn't wrap myself up in my world because no one needed to tell me. Because you know why? I would have considered that settling for less. Did I look at that as a sacrifice? Never. Do you look at your Christian life as a sacrifice? As a list of don'ts? Because, see, I could have looked at my fatherhood that way. Because you have four boys, these are the things, Tim, you are not going to do. Rather, I would have considered doing those things instead of spending time with my boys as settling for less. What a great place to be in our faith. Wouldn't wouldn't that be a gift from God's future? That anything the world throws at us would truly look like wood, hay, and stubble. Because the future relationship that heralds God's new world as arriving has rushed forward to meet us in the present. And the relationship brings the requirements. That's the new cup.